A few days ago, as I'm recording this video, we have lost a very pivotal and a very important political and historical figure of the 20th century. On the 30th of August 2022, we lost the last leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. A very controversial figure who everybody seems to have a different opinion of, and regardless what you think of him, he definitely is a person that left an impact not only on Russia and the Soviet Union, obviously, but also on the history of the world as a whole. And I personally think, in a historical perspective, Mikhail Gorbachev is a political figure figure that is actually super unique and super polarizing because it seems that the West collectively has a lot of praise for Gorbachev whereas people from the ex-Soviet countries especially Russians have a very very negative opinion of him. Hello Blazers, it is your boy Roman, your favorite neighborhood Russian, how you guys doing today? Welcome to a brand new video and in today's video guys I want to talk about Mikhail Gorbachev and compare the perception of Gorbachev in the West and in the East and also discuss why Russians especially Russian boomers hate Gorbachev so much with some of my own opinions and also also with some of my own experience as well. I want to start off by saying that my own opinion of Gorbachev is very, very conflicted. Honestly, regarding his worldviews, his values, and his principles, I feel like Gorbachev is one of the best, if not the best, Soviet leaders the Soviet Union has ever gotten. But as a leader, as a strategist, as a manager, he was a complete and utter failure. And also, a lot of people like to claim that Gorbachev was one of the only Soviet leaders who was not bloody. He didn't shed any blood. You know, he let Germany reunify and everything. That's why people in Germany like him a lot. But during Gorbachev's reign, there have been very, very dark pages of history where blood was shed. Let's take, for example, Georgia, the country that I live in right now. On the 9th of April of 1989, the Red Army moved into Tbilisi and crushed an oppositional demonstration by the order of Gorbachev, in which 21 people died and 290 got injured. And a similar situation has happened in multiple other post-Soviet countries, for example, in Lithuania, in Latvia, in Azerbaijan. And also, you could argue that a lot of the ethnic conflicts that propped up as a result of the dissolution of the Soviet Union, which was the result of Gorbachev's entire reign, pretty much, that they also were basically Gorbachev's falls, which is actually something I don't really agree with, and I want to discuss it a bit later in this video. Now, I don't want to dive into the historical events too much, so let me give you an abrupt story of Gorbachev and the dissolution of the USSR in my view. So the Soviet leader that was for a while in power before Gorbachev was Leonid Brezhnev, and uh, his rule in general is known in the Soviet Union as the era of stagnation. It was pretty much an era in which the Soviet economy wasn't doing that that great, it became way more dependent on oil, but production and industry were in a decent condition, there was a decent enough supply of food products. If you talk to an average Russian today who's over 55, 60 years old, they will tell you that Brezhnev's times were great and uh, they lived a good life, nothing bad was really going on, every country lived in peace, all the republics of the Soviet Union lived in peace, and yeah, a lot of the boomers don't even mention the Afghanistan war either, and they don't remember it that well, even though I think it was one of the things that sort of led to the dissolution of the USSR. When Gorbachev came into power, he decided to kickstart a whole new process called Perestroika, which means the rebuilding. And the overall idea of the reform of the program was to democratize and to liberalize the economy of the Soviet Union to make it more of a market economy, sort of like what Deng Xiaoping did in China. Part of the Perestroika was also a movement to rekindle relationships with the Western nations, the United States, Europe, and also another very important point was to democratize the society, to allow free speech in the Soviet Union, to ban censorship. This policy was called glassness, which also became a word that uh, crossed over into English. Yo, I'm the host with the most glass, though. Assholes made a mess and the war got cold. Now, I'm not gonna tell you guys everything that happened during the Perestroika, because it's like too much, and it warrants its own video, to be honest. But long story short, I guess you could say that Perestroika did two things. First of all, yes, it did greatly improve the free speech and remove the censorship in the Soviet Union, although it still existed in some regards, I mean, you know, talking about the Chernobyl disaster, for example, and the KGB was still looking over activists and stuff like that. But still, and ironically, I feel like probably during that time, in the 1989 or something, there was more free speech in the Soviet Union than there is in Russia in 2022, so. Although, don't take my word for it, I wouldn't know. I didn't live in 1989, obviously. And I don't come from a dynasty of dissidents or something, so my parents were just regular workers, so I guess their life didn't change much. And yeah, I wouldn't say the Soviet Union became a country with free speech, like, completely unchallenged by anything, but still, just the fact that the effort was done, and that Gorbachev went the length to actually do it, speaks a lot about his character, and how he was wildly different from a lot of the other Soviet leaders of the past. However, 
the consequences of perestroika for the economy and also for the overall climate in the Soviet Union was terrible. Essentially, Gorbachev's plan to create a market economy failed. They gave people the ability to open businesses, for example, because in the Soviet Union before Gorbachev, if you tried to open a business, you would go to jail for uh, stealing the socialist workers' property or something, essentially stealing the government's shit. But trying to merge a market economy with a planned communist economy didn't work, and the country was in terrible deficit. If you've seen those pictures of the USSR where, you know, there's people walking around and there's like empty shelves, like nothing on them, that is actually Gorbachev times. Uh, the entirety of the Soviet Union was going into terrible debt, the Soviet ruble was plunging down. In 1991, for example, the growth of the Soviet economy was negative 11%, so this was no dangest miracle at all. But what happened is that the social climate in the Soviet Union actually got way worse, because the lack of regulation, the loosening of government control of certain regions, and overall the country doing terribly, led to people in a lot of the Soviet republics thinking, hey, maybe we should just leave. And this led not only to the uh, crushing of the dissent that I mentioned earlier in countries like Georgia, Lithuania, etc., but also the slack of regulation has led to the reappearance of many ethnic conflicts that the Soviet Union has been keeping it low by, you know, controlling it. The Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, Armenia and Azerbaijan, Georgia and Abkhazia, Georgia and South Ossetia, Moldova and Transnistria. I'm probably forgetting some that are massively important, but a lot of these happens after the Soviet Union technically fell and Gorbachev was not in power anymore, but these are events that did start during the perestroika. And all these ethnic conflicts and a terrible state of the economy then has led to every single uh, post-Soviet republic country going through some terrible times. I mean, the 90s for most of these post-Soviet countries have been absolutely awful. Rampant crime and gang warfare on the streets, gangs literally controlling entire countries, the omnipresent poverty, which in some places led to famine, several wars and ethnic conflicts. I mean, for pretty much everybody in the post-Soviet countries, Gorbachev's rule and as a result, the entire dissolution of the Soviet Union has been a terrible tragedy that ruined millions of lives. And obviously, a lot of people in the ex-Soviet countries have a very, very negative opinion of Gorbachev. However, Gorbachev's influence in the West has seemed to be sort of positive. There was a huge disarmament movement, and the Soviet Union actually removed a lot of its nukes from Europe. The reunification of Germany. And I guess you could argue that uh, Gorbachev did not shed blood in a lot of the European countries that also decided to break away from the socialist influence. So, for example, you have Czech Republic, they had the Velvet Revolution. Technically, the Soviet Union could have been like, yeah, let's send tanks to Prague, etc, etc, etc. And also, Gorbachev had decent relations with the United States, and he gave the Soviet people McDonald's. So, for the collective West, Gorbachev is a very positive figure, and just the headlines that have been published when he passed away uh, prove it, because the majority of the European newspapers, American outlets and everything, they paint Gorbachev as a very, you know, influential figure who not only gave his country freedom, but also gave freedom to the world. But nevertheless, regardless of anybody's opinion, Gorbachev has been super influential in the history of the world. Uh, I want to show you this clip as well from an interview with a uh, Russian oppositional politician. Внутри себя, я думаю, что Путин относится к Горбачеву с ненавистью, но Горбачев стал вершителем судеб мира в силу того, что не захотел пролить кровь. Горбачев — это политик жизни. Он страшно ошибался. Он был наивным. Он не был готов к той махине, которую он сам сдвинул с места. Он не понимал, как реформировать эту огромную страну. Он заблуждался, он принимал противоречивые решения. Но кровь пролилась. Пролилась, потому что он не отдавал себе отчет тому, что он стронул с места. Горбачев уже сейчас, он великий политик. Путин хочет быть великим политиком, более великим. Он хочет всемирной славы, самую большую всемирную славу из политиков конца советского периода и постсоветского периода все равно получил Горбачев, лишившийся власти, отказавшийся от власти. Дело в том, что все вышли из шинели Горбачева. Все политики и лично Путин вышли из шинели Горбачева. Сам Путин — это политический ребенок Горбачева. Он всех освободил, он всем предоставил возможность показать себя, какие они есть, свою слабость, свою силу, свою честность, свою подлость. Горбачев создал пространство свободы. So let's talk about this. Why do people from ex-Soviet countries, and especially Russians, and I want to talk about this uh, more obviously because I'm Russian myself, why do they hate Gorbachev so much? Honestly, I would say it's because Gorbachev is associated with a very negative time in uh, millions of people's lives. The 90s were a very hard time for Russia and for the other post-Soviet countries. People went through a lot of shit, and they think that Gorbachev is the reason it all started. And just from my experience, 
experience. Every single time, like I was with my family or something, ever since I was a kid, I remember this. Whenever there's like a political talk, political discussion uh, that your family has, my family, especially the older generations, there was like, yeah, fuck that motherfucker Gorbachev. He sold us out to the West. He ruined the country. He ruined all of our lives. He destroyed the USSR. And for what? For some fucking Snickers and Coca Cola and McDonald's, he gave our entire country away. And he made our lives shitty. And honestly, I think it's a bit of a reductive take and it puts too much blame on Gorbachev as, as one person. But here's the thing I do get where they're coming from, from their point of view. Let me elaborate. So, first of all, about them putting too much blame on Gorbachev. The thing is, Gorbachev didn't single handedly destroy the USSR in like six, seven years or something. He inherited a country and a system that was already completely fallen apart, it was corrupt, it was unsustainable, and the plan in itself was like not good. <laughs> All these ethnic conflicts over borders and land that propped up, you know, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Abkhazia, Transnistria, Moldova, etc. These borders were not put in place by Gorbachev. These countries, these regions were not planned out and crossed on the map by Gorbachev. It was done by people decades and decades before that, and that's shit has been brewing for decades and years and years and years and years. And then he just slightly loosened his grip on that and it all came crashing the fuck down because it was always there. A lot of Russians like to say that the Soviet Union during like Brezhnev times for example, the Soviet Union was a country where every nation, everybody lived in peace, everybody loved each other, everybody was friends etc. But then Gorbachev came and destroyed it all and everybody became enemies. That's absolutely not the case. I think the people who lived in Russia in the Soviet Union, they just don't know shit, <laughs> quite honestly. The truth truth is that I feel like all of this dissent that was in there very deeply was just covered very well. And then when Gorbachev decided to give everybody free speech and sort of freedom, that's when shit popped off. Also, Russians heavily associate Gorbachev with what followed after him. Like I said, the 90s were a very tough time in Russia. You had the Chechen wars, you had an insane crime rate, and the country was pretty much controlled by gangs. Still is, kind of. The poverty was insane, and the corruption got crazy too, because Yeltsin was one corrupt motherfucker. And Russians look at the first day decade of Russia's existence as a separate country, which was not good. It had free speech. It was very free, but the life was just not good. And Russians just look at that Yeltsin period as an extension of the Gorbachev period, because if Gorbachev did not destroy the Soviet Union, then there would be no Yeltsin, there would be no 90s, you know? Which also I think is kind of unfair. I think it's unfair to uh, put all of Yeltsin's sins on Gorbachev. However, like I said, I do kind of get where they're coming from, and I wanna dive into this a little bit more. I think this all pretty much comes down to the uh, debates of what is better, like freedom or comfort. Because here's the thing, I feel like Gorbachev represented freedom, not comfort for a lot of people. And a Soviet person doesn't need freedom because he doesn't know how to use it, because he's never had it. A Soviet person, I feel like, was taught to live by a very simple principle. The government covers everything and makes sure that you have a comfortable life. You have your free education, you have your free hospitals, you have your job, you have your free apartment that you have to wait 20 years for, but still. But Gorbachev, I feel like, was kind of ahead of his time. He gave the people something that they didn't really want. He gave them freedom, which they didn't know what to do with, and giving them freedom took away their comforts, their comfortable, careless life in the times of Brezhnev that they talk about. And then the freedom that he gave to the people backfired and also created a whole new decade of the 90s. Let's take only Russia, right? In a separate, independent Russia, which had a lot of freedom but no comfort, and people didn't like it at all. And this is, I feel like, where Putin's success as a leader today and his popularity lies in. Because Putin was sort of a reaction to all of that. He brought back the comfort for a while and he took away the freedom. From 2004 to like 2013, I think, life in Russia was good. It was already not very free. Freer than it is now, but still. People's wealth and quality of life has been increasing a lot. The ruble was very strong, the relations with the world were pretty good, people traveled, people bought new tech, people had comfort. And I feel like at that time, the Russian government was like, there you go, you have this comfort, life is good, just don't touch politics, just don't intervene into politics. And the majority of people were like, yeah, it makes sense, I mean, what, what is there to complain? Life is good, again. But people just don't realize that if you give your freedom away for comfort, sooner or later your comfort will also get taken away from you. And this is exactly what is going on right now in Russia. And I feel like this is the fundamental divide in the Russian society that started with Gorbachev. There's people who like freedom, and there's people who prefer comfort. Here's a really good excerpt from an interview with a Russian rapper that I want to show you. 90 Как вы интерпретируете эти времена? Это было хорошо или это было плохо? Ну, как и все времена, они такие были разные, но мне они запомнились хорошими. Была свобода, 
было такое временное окошко, в которое можно было почувствовать себя свободным. Может быть, люди там жили бедно, многие. Ну, а тут уже вопрос приоритетов. Как бы я сам просто жил бедно в этот период, но мне важнее свобода. Вот. А многим людям важнее, ну, в общем, как бы, чтобы у них был какой-то минимум, и они, наверное, это время вспоминают с грустью, а я наоборот. Ну, слушайте, а вам возразят, а что делать с этой свободой, если у тебя нет бабок даже в Польшу съездить? Не то, что мир посмотреть, за океан слетать. Свобода такая вещь, тут каждый решает, что с ней сделать. Но, в общем, мне кажется, если ты не знаешь, что сделать со своей свободой, значит, она тебе не нужна. Тут, мне кажется, каждый сам отвечает на этот вопрос для себя. Yeah, he's pretty much talking about the same thing as I am. The 90s, which people, uh, especially like Soviet boomers, look at as a time that Gorbachev caused, which was terrible, from some people's perspective, was actually not that bad. And of course, I'm not trying to say right now that, you know, there was no reason to complain or whatever, the 90s did suck. But yeah, I feel like that is a point from which a lot of Russians are coming, especially, you know, those who lived in the Soviet Union in its golden days. And also, I feel like a lot of the older Russians just really hate Gorbachev because they feel like he took their country away. This is like kind of a meme at this point, but you probably know that Putin referred to the dissolution of the USSR as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And honestly, he's kind of right. And it was that for hundreds of millions of people. Ties that existed before were cut off. Not even just like infrastructure or businesses or companies or something. Families were destroyed and cut away from each other. And I feel like from their point of view, those people who lived in the Soviet Union for their whole life, who loved their country, Country, they saw their country and the peace of themselves be destroyed in front of their very own eyes, you know? And that's probably a lot of trauma, and I feel like the dissolution of the USSR has been a very traumatic event for every Russian that lived through that. So, a lot of those who hate him choose Gorbachev as a sort of a boogeyman, like, he did this, he destroyed a country. And I just don't think that's very fair, but people always like boogeymans, I guess, and that's just human nature. Honestly, I feel like Gorbachev was uh, absolutely monumental, and uh, a lot of people truly don't realize the absolute weight in the game that he had. Just the overall historical impact this man has had. And like I said, I do honestly feel like his heart, like his principles, his uh, ideas, they came from a right place. He was not a man of uh, war, he was not a man of censorship, but he was not an effective leader who has made a lot of mistakes which led to bloodshed. So yeah, my opinion of Gorbachev is honestly very conflicted, but all I can say is uh, rest in peace and uh, thank you for trying. Thank you guys for watching this video, kind of a longer one this one, but I feel like there's a lot to say on this topic. If you guys did enjoy today's video, then please make sure to slap the like on it. As well, guys, if you want to support me additionally, go over to the link in the description, become a member of this channel, donate to me, it's like YouTube's own version of Patreon, I would very much appreciate it. And yeah, guys, thank you so much for watching today's video, and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.